All right, Paul, we are live. I'm with Paul Common. Again, we've had we had a great response to um, our, I think I called it War, What Is It Good For? Yeah. Uh, video. And so we're back again. And uh, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself briefly. And then uh, this is definitely a topic that uh, you've, you've put some thought into. So I'll, I'll let you describe it. Yeah, well, at the basis of this is um, the notion of how social culture can move into military culture, comes into a practice of arms, and how certain things remain constant between ages for certain cultures, and how things can remain constant or relatively constant um, between certain cultures when it comes to these things. And then, of course, you've got the question of where the designer um the chap producing or the lady producing uh a war game will move into that process because of course you can think of say um a game like here i stand the game covering the um, events of the wars of the reformation where there is a vast amount of social context right it's to do with theology it's to do with the tensions between different relations to sex on the other hand, you have, um, say, a game such as one of the Clash of Arms La Bataille series, which give every indication of being purely and simply about combat. But there are certain traits and certain aspects of the way in which the game is presented, which hark, to, hark back to certain social contexts. So where I thought I would start off, um, I wanted to give a few examples of where this can be, in some cases, very subtle and where it can be much more in your face. Sure. And where I thought I would start was with a very old game. It brace yourselves. Um, this is a game from 1971 in its first incarnation. Although I think most people know it better from the version that came out in 74, which was the Gary Gygax design, Alexander the Great. Now, that design, for all of the fact that you know, the hobby has moved on since those days and things are done differently, it does present certain key aspects of these concepts hmm. of social culture moving into military culture moving into a practice of arms but it's very subtle in places especially when you think of the greek macedonian army of alexander the great because if you ask yourself there um is there any real social context feeding into a practice of arms it would be very tempting to say no because the one kind of warrior that you would associate with ancient Greece in the broad term was the hoplite. And Philip, Alexander's father, and then Alexander himself had smashed numerous hoplite armies to pieces. Hmm. So by the time Alexander is moving into Asia, the hoplite has evolved into something else. And all of Alexander's army and the way in which it fights its method is about system. Hmm. It's absolutely about system. It's about having an army, well, the term that's often used is hammer and anvil. The, okay. uh, the anvil was the phalanx, the hammer was the companion cavalry and the other heavy cavalry, and between them they would decide the battle. Uh, but the hoplite, as um, the heroic legendary figure of Greek culture, it had its day by that time. Um, another little thing that you can bring forward by way of showing that it was more about system is that later in his campaigning life, Alexander was bringing um, contingents from other nations, including conquered nations, such as various uh, branches of the Persian Empire, into his army to fight to his method. Mm. And that's, if you've ever seen the Oliver Stone, uh, Alexander, uh, when you have the very stylized uh, rendering of the Battle of Hydaspes towards the end of the film, you see very briefly these very typical Persian warriors standing next to their Greek counterparts in the phalanx. And this is what he was doing, he was incorporating them. The Persian army is a different matter and it, it can get quite technical because it, have you ever seen the game? I don't believe I have. 
And I want to I want to know we don't have anybody in yet, but I told Paul even coming in that I will be learning from him here. This is not my area of expertise. So everybody, anybody asking, that's what I'm here to do as well. But I thought it was a great discussion. So I have it. But go ahead. This is already. Yes, sure. Yeah. Well, with um, the Persian army, there's a very obvious difference between the quality of its cavalry, which is the main hitting aspect of the Persian army and his infantry, which is very, very mediocre. Hmm. Now, amongst other things, this reflects a that Darius, the Persian king, had already lost uh, the Western portions of his empire. So he couldn't draw any more upon that kind of pool of um, warriors to help bolster his forces. He just didn't have them anymore. The best of his infantry are what remains of his own foot guards and what remains of the Greek mercenaries who were being paid to fight for him. Everyone else, well, they're basically tribal levies that are being told, bring a high shield and a pointy stick with you, you know, and, <laughs> and they just they just stand there. But the, 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 the cavalry is a different matter. You know, this is an Eastern Empire army from the central plains of Asia, the man on horseback, the man who has prowess has nobility. The man who can afford to equip himself and his retinue on horseback with armor is the man with the power. And this feeds into something we'll see much, much later on with a completely different army in a different battle. But this Persian army is fighting first and foremost through its cavalry, through these noblemen and the retinue of the noblemen who very nearly win the battle for him. Um, I mean, there are other things you can refer to with Alexander the Great, such as, of course, um, the cultural reference of the horse archers on the Persian side, which again represent a uh, derivation of the hunting tradition of mm -hmm. Asia. Uh, but first and foremost, you just get the basics with this game, but it is sort of there. Now, it's tempting to say on the basis of what happened at Gilgamesh, which is a battle modelled in Alexander the Great, that you get problems with what you might loosely call multi-ethnic armies, armies that come from different traditions, they're brought together. Now, in the case of the Persian Empire, it didn't work too well, certainly not against a very honed system such as the Greeks and the Macedonians had. It's a different matter if you start making easy assumptions about this. When you get to, for example, just a hundred or so years later, with Hannibal at Cannae. Now, the Carthaginians, I mean, if you ever set up or you see video of... Um, the SPQR scenario for Cannae. You have got this massive great array of units that have been drawn from all over the place to make the Carthaginian army. They're from uh, Numidia, they're from Libya, they're from Iberia, they're from Gaul. They're paying people en route to come and join the army. Mm. It isn't melded into a system, but it is incredibly efficient because if you play the game, you understand that Hannibal and his immediate commanders are given such abilities that they could just respond better. He knew how to place things. He knew how to get the most out of his strengths as well as his weaknesses. And his army fights remarkably well, despite the fact that it's essentially an army of bits and pieces. Quick question. Yeah, sure. So my experience gaming wise would be command and colors. Yeah. It's a lighter system I know but with your knowledge base that you're bringing, is that a game system that you think reflects this idea that we're exploring? It can do. Um, or is, I, it too, is it too tactical? No, the, the thing about um, commands and colors, it, it's, it's got one deficiency. Uh, in terms of how it represents, I mean, it doesn't really take into account necessarily that much of an ethnic character but it does um have you can you still see me yes okay that's it going into rest again um yeah. <laughs> something has to happen didn't it but anyway um you have this thing about d 
different weapon types and troop types that have different abilities based upon different weapon types that it does very well the only thing i've ever felt was missing from commands and colors is a sense that if an army is going to set up a certain way which it will do in game after game it will present you with a commands and colors take on uh, the historical deployments that is meant to fit a plan that those commanders came up with but if you don't like the plan having it set up like the historical troops you've then got to try and wiggle your way out of it mm -hmm. or if it was a really good plan you can't carry it out because you haven't got the cards in your hand gotcha so i always felt that based upon what your plan was you should have a set of cards that you can pick from to set your plan out if you are deemed to be the better commanded force okay sure that um you would have an extra little deck that would say i can set my plan up by playing these cards in a particular order to get my plan underway and then after that good luck with it but um now that's the only thing it's really missing okay uh, I, I do like i like i love the series actually i mean it looks beautiful when it's all set up especially in this epic mode sure uh but they say with um um going but keeping with the ancients uh when you have um this incredibly diverse army that um hannibal has at um at cannae and at other battles it's again a very different approach to again a very old game but it does make the point a game called caesar's legions which was about rome's campaigns along the rhine danube frontier um roughly from the time of julius caesar through to the time of nero and all the legions have the same strength well you might see that as being a little bit of casual design work but it also represents the fact that irrespective of whether the legion was predominantly syrian or predominantly from gaul it had that roman fighting method and that is again a completely different take on working with a multi-ethnic army compared to for example the, the hannibal's force mm. so you know we, we have these different representations of the same thing or much the same thing going across um you know different different um, armies from different powers and civilizations but where it gets really interesting is when you move forward right out of an era into a completely different era and you still see the same things coming up hmm. who is given priority in a fight who is regarded as being the people deserving to be in the front rank i wouldn't fancy being in the front rank but there you are <laughs> um you know. the forlorn hope yeah well precisely yeah it's um well the the battle i had in mind for that and again we won't be talking about old designs all the time but this was a thought again a game that made a very strong point was um agincourt by spi mm -hmm. now this is a game that goes back about 40 years now and there's a massive paradox with agincourt very famous battle very very famous battle um lots of great and terrible events happening um the story of henry v one of the great english victories looks absolutely perfectly set to make a great war game it makes a rotten war game <laughs> i mean it's a very good you can make very good simulations okay but the problem is it was such a foregone conclusion i mean it shouldn't have been i mean you had what five to six thousand english longbowmen against the French army that may have numbered up to about 30,000. And the French actually did have a plan for Agincourt, which would have had a very good chance of working, except they didn't use it. Hmm. You can still read it, it still exists, it was all written down. Sure. And they were gonna go around the flanks of Henry's army with their cavalry, and they were going to distract the archers by having their own archers and crossbowmen fire at them and then their own dismounted nobility would advance uh, under the cover of that and it all looks completely tickety-boo <laughs> and well yeah it looked fine until the until the french got drunk <laughs> and what they did they, it was it was it was a it was a night of debauchery i'll tell you it was 
they were all sitting in their tents, you know, boasting about how many English they were going to kill the following day and deciding who was going to stand next to who on the field. But ultimately, what they couldn't bring themselves to admit was that this plan, although it had a very good chance of working, they almost saw it subconsciously as an admission that they couldn't be an English longbow army of peasants in a frontal attack. And they wanted to be able to beat them in a frontal attack. It was that demand that was on them. So you have this huge army, which is chock full of the nobility of France, from the ordinary knights right up to the big earls and the big names. And they just expect that their blood, their chivalry, their being better than their opponents is going to compensate for having thousands of arrows shot at them. Hmm. And, and of course, it doesn't work like that. But they couldn't escape their own doctrinal social bond. And even though the SPI Agincor hasn't got any real specific rules, and certainly not that many, which are to do with this is how these units are going to behave because they're full of noblemen. This is how they're going to behave because they, they've come from a certain privileged background. It's all being put and it's all hanging around in the background. It's in the way in which the two armies set up. It's in the fact that even though you can play it with the French plan, it never feels that convincing because they never were going to do it. Hmm. And then just the last kind of um, example I would give of this, again, holding true through the centuries is when you get to the American Civil War. And when you get to matters of who was entitled to fight, things get very interesting because although it's a completely different context, a completely different war, there is still this notion of you're not going to wear the uniform. You don't deserve or you have no part of this society, so you can't wear the uniform. And of course, even though there were plenty of um, you know, young black men in the north by the time the war started, who would have been ready to serve from day one, they didn't get in until at least about what, two years or so had passed. Right. You know, despite the campaigning of people like Frederick Douglass, because there was just too much opposition from the white establishment. They didn't want that. Uh, a lot of the ordinary soldiers didn't want that. The copperheads didn't want that. And it took a lot of manoeuvring and push and shove to actually get the first black units um, in uniform and on their way. As for the South, well, if you've played any um, American Civil War game, the recreation of the entire war, I mean, we all know whether it's a game like Lincoln, which I know you reviewed not so very long ago, or um, a game like um, the, the Eric Lee Smith um, Civil War, mm -hmm. there's always a shortage on the South, which is partly their economics, but has a lot to do with the um, the fact that they haven't got the manpower and they could have potentially had more manpower if they'd got rid of slavery, but they never were going to. It had to be kind of, in a sense, kicked out of them. Right. Uh, well, even, even as it was brought up, it was uh, like scandalous when it was, I can't remember the individual, but that was even brought up as the war got more and more desperate. And if I remember just from some of my reading, the South was like, like if if we emancipated our own slaves to fight with us, we might as well sue for peace now. Yeah. I remember a quote from um, John Bell Hood's book, Advance and Retreat, where he says uh, at some point in it that, well, I think probably uh, you might have been thinking of Patrick Claiborne, the, um, the Southern commander in the army of the Tennessee was killed at Franklin who had been a figure calling for getting rid of slavery and trying to get some southern black men into the confederate army but of course it was intensely resisted and there's john bell who said well maybe claiborne did have the right idea after all but of course it was all very after the event with um, with hood because that's certainly not the way he felt during the war mm -hmm. um so Again, you, you do have this notion of, or well, two notions. First of all, in the American Civil War, just as it's the nobility that are muscling their way to the front of the French army at Agincourt, 
and the disdainful attitude they have towards the English yeoman peasant. And just as you've got these Persian nobility on their horses at Galgamela looking to lead the Persian court, you also have this notion, which is either overcome eventually or not overcome at all, that fighting in the American Civil War was to do with your ethnic status. Mm. Although there were some odd exceptions, of course, because I think both sides um, employed Native Americans. I think they were Confederate Cherokee regiments. Um, and also there's a famous painting of Lee sign signing the surrender document at Appomattox Courthouse. And amongst Grant's staff, there was a Native American general, but I, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I can't recall either. Now, a question, a question on this. So we're literally with the American Civil War at the junction of, of warfare changing with Sherman taking the war to the people and, and you know, making, making them howl and want it over. Do you see the, you know, what causes that shift there? Is it the Northern mindset that, uh, that comes in as opposed to the South's mindset of chivalry? Do you see any influences from that? Uh, I know that Hood, when he was responsible for the defense of Atlanta, wrote to Sherman, or they, they exchanged communications over the lines. And of course, Hood was of that mindset that this was all outrageous, you know, shelling the streets of Atlanta and killing or threatening to kill um, civilians, including women and children, was just not on. And I think Sherman's attitude was partly where you started this matey, mm -hmm. followed by, um, you know, the famous quote, war is hell, you can't reform it, the quicker it's over, the better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also probably another aspect of it was war was becoming, this is a major theme in the American Civil War, it's becoming more industrialized. You know, when you look at many games, many aspects of um, waging warfare in earlier times, although economics can come into it, it's really in the American Civil War that the output of factories, the movement of troops by rail, a whole range of other things are coming in. And the number of assets and the number of things you have to get at in order to prevent your opponent from waging war successfully against you is increasing and will almost naturally include factories and docks and depots and railway lines and stations inside of cities mm -hmm. because that's where the sustenance of war is coming from. So the, um, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I see exactly what you're saying with the, the, so back to your point, the, the South, uh, jockeying for that position. Um, uh, I know even at, uh, and I'm, I'm going to forget all the names. I'm not as strong with the American Civil War, but at Gettysburg, Lee's orders on day one were not to do a full engagement, but the but the the general near there thought, well, I have it, I I have this, and he engages, and kind of puts Lee at a disadvantage. Yeah, I think the best modelling that I've seen of the temperament of an American Civil War battlefield has come from the Gamers series, where you had the the orders system where you could send an order and either it would get obeyed eventually or it would get obeyed fairly quickly or it wouldn't get obeyed at all and there was always a chance with certain commanders that they'd go off and do their own thing mm. and of course lee was um you know very much in terms of well i think i might call him the sergeant wilson of the confederacy he was in any kind of a dad's army reference it was all would you mind doing this or can I request or will you take this hill if practicable? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, no other commander would couch things like that. I mean, certainly not Wellington. He would just come basically say, you want to, I want that and go and get it. Mm. You, know, you can't imagine Patton saying that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, polite requests to people. Um, so the, the, the times were changing and I think both sides, but certainly the South, had this 
a binding sense of honour which gets reflected in the way in which you're supposed to carry out the honour that's at the order system in this series of games. You know, you, you issue an order at seven o'clock in the morning to travel to a core commander to say, I want you to take this nice empty hill and put your artillery on it. He doesn't do anything with it until three o'clock in the afternoon, by which time your opponent has put plenty of troops up there. But you can't get out of the order within the spirit of the game. The attack still has to go ahead because that is what is expected. And shame and dishonour would follow if you didn't do that. Which again brings you back, like who is entitled to fight, to earlier notions. The notion that you have at um, Agincourt that the, that the nobility must attack frontally must go in where they can be seen and it is again you know with, with the south of Gettysburg the obvious example of Pickett's Charge mm -hmm. very bad idea by the time it was launched but it went ahead because as Longstreet said the commanding general won't have it any other way so you no know, feeding these, feeding these things in does create extra realism Good. We also have uh, Trevor Just is on board, and he says, hey, Bart and Paul. Hello there. I've, I've told him hello, Trevor. So thanks for coming along. Um, all right, so continuing your theme there. I know because uh, – so that that brings us through the millennias. What other – do you and, – and you can set the pacing. You had intrigued me with, let's just say, uh, cow grease. Do you want to touch into that now? Yeah, well, this um, this is where I wanted to kind of move into a notion of where you move into things which are more particular, in many cases, to particular ethnicities and cultures and identities. Um, now, the one that I actually did have in mind, because I think probably it's the one that people would feel comfortable with and have a certain interest with, was actually with Japan. Okay. Now, I would recommend anyone who um, wanted an interesting, albeit controversial, a little bit edgy, introduction to um, to um, the Japanese mindset and mentality when it comes to military practice, to look up some YouTube interviews with, um, we was an author, playwright, actor, many, many things, uh, a Japanese chap by the name of Yukio Mishima, or Mishima. Hmm. Now, he, um, in proper parlance, would probably be called very right wing in today's standards. But he was, you know, Japanese. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. It's just an easy label to put on him. Okay. Um, you know, Mishima was very proud of the fact that he was descended from samurai heritage. Um, and he gave this interview um, at some point in the 1960s where he said you can identify two aspects to Japanese character. One is elegance, which is not difficult to work with at all because obviously elegance, um, a lot of Japanese art is, it has a beautiful simplicity about it. They don't usually go in for over elaboration you know, with the way in which they have their room space ordered and the overall sense of Japanese decor and presentation. So elegance was one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it he identified was brutality. Hmm. Now, this was him speaking. And, of course, you see this in a range of games over the years <coughs> or games that represent conflict over the years. Um, Again, from the great battles of history, you have the code of the samurai and the samurai sword. It doesn't disappear with the end of the medieval period. It carries right through to the Second World War. You know, it is this, this symbol of honour and the weapon of honour. And the Japanese notion of being taken prisoner and what constitutes dishonor you start then feeding into you now whether you're playing a game like the great battles of history uh with a game like ram or whether you're playing 
well, the Academy Games uh, Guadalcanal. You know, th there's an overlap. You know, there is this thing of, well, the bands I charge. Mm -hmm. You know, these, these are things that have carried on. And, of course, you get into phases where the Japanese, although they're fighting very much with what we can call modern tech, has still got that bygone attitude. Um, you see it, for example, with um, the kamikaze. Right. Yep. You know, the, the divine wind, the sense of sacrifice, uh, the sense of there is a mysticism to their warrior ethos. And we can see it at the receiving end in a game like Picket Duty, um, where, you're, of course, you're playing the solitary, trying to look after this American destroyer or light cruiser as um, you now these planes come diving down on it. Um, but, it, of course, it, it harkens back. The name itself, Kamikaze, which, of course, was the name given to the storm which destroyed the Mongol fleet way back then. Right. Um, but the, the Japanese are a very good example of enduring traits in their military, in their martial character. But there are some interesting um, aberrations from that. Hmm. Well, I love real quick, I love your point because I know like from the movie The Last Samurai shows that shift into uh, making their armies more of that imperial army and trained in the clash of cultures and where they're going to be. Exactly. I love that shift. And then, but you're right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm tracking a hundred percent with you because you see how that carries over. And I know, oh, it was years ago. I'm sure the gentleman's passed, but I, I love World War II history. So when I would run into veterans, I would ask them, you know, where did you serve and how, and, and I talked to a gentleman, he was on a, uh, it was in a ship on a task force. He wasn't on a carrier, but he was in a task force with one. And he had mentioned just even at the time, the American mindset could I mean, they had a real hard time fathoming the kamikaze. They couldn't understand how that would, you know, they, they understood, okay, you're, you're wounded. You can't pull out and maybe you, you send your dauntless into the, into the ship as a sacrifice, but not the idea that your whole goal is to go out and, and kamikaze or die. Mm. Yeah, it was, it is this enduring aspect of the Japanese character I mean, they've moved on. They're an incredibly modern people in some ways, but are very tied to what they regard as the most important aspects of their heritage, mm -hmm. which makes them absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, one of the, the, the aberrations I also thought of is, you know, you, in, you have this interesting paradox of Japanese pilots in fighter aircraft or torpedo bomber aircraft, modern tech, relatively speaking, acting as if they're kind of, riding into battle in the 14th century or so. But then when they come to their Navy and the need to modernize their Navy, as Japan looked to move from its medieval, its enduring medieval nature into the beginnings of the 20th century, they looked to the Royal Navy because the Royal Navy was the prestige Navy and it won all these battles. And they modeled so much of the way in which their Navy was commanded the style of the uniform, even the kind of ships they were buying as well as building upon the British models. Right, the battleships. Yeah, the battleships and the battle cruisers. You know, they they, they, they went very much with the British model. And, um, you know, it does make this, you know, the, the, nothing is ever hard and fast. I mean, this is stuff that is very difficult to bring across in a war game because ship counters just look like ship counters. But, I mean... There's a very interesting little film that a gentleman called Mark Felton has produced on YouTube. He has his own channel. And he's got this little film which talks about Britain's last battleship, which is a catchy little title because he's not talking about, well, we haven't got any battleships unless you really want to count the, um, the victory, which is completely out of context for this. He's talking about the Mikasa, Hmm. which was a pre-dreadnought battleship, which was the flagship of the Japanese Navy at Tsushima. But it was built in Britain. In fact, it was built in Barrow, which is not terribly far away from where I live. Hmm. And um, But, of course, it ended up on the other side of the world. It's now got this place of honour in a dry dock. 
I think at Tokyo Docks in Japan. Well, I'd love to go and visit that because I know where it was built. Sure. Uh, but it is, you know, it is this almost material evidence that although the Japanese kept this fighting spirit and alarm based upon their own national traits, where they could bring in something that was better from abroad, especially when it came to tactics and hardware, they would. Um, so that's, I mean, this is, you know, the most obvious things about the Japanese are things such as the Banzai Charge. In a game like Up Front, the Code of Bushido, uh, if you've played any tactical ja games involving Japanese forces from the Second World War, they still have those traits. Certain terms will refer back. Right. Yeah, Academy Games with Guadalcanal included yeah. Bushido points to because they would eat you know uva had said it's real hard to get players to actually play the way the japanese fought so he came up with the bushido points which then allowed them to do certain other things to encourage that behavior yeah and there's another little aspect of this which is worth mentioning which has got nothing to do with how units behave but is to do with how the player or players are introduced to the subject and that is i think i saw it more with japanese subjects than anywhere else although it has started to move into other subject matter which is the use of a certain style of presentation to give you the feeling that you are in the era the period the location where the game is set and the most obvious example of that, well, the most obvious one for me, is Sekigahara. Mm. Uh, the game which uses, well, I'm sure they're not lacquered blocks, but they're meant to look like lacquered blocks sure. with Japanese iconography on them. I mean, in practical terms, it's just a different way of putting symbols on a block and saying we'll shove that around on the map. But it's actually done with an aesthetic which introduces the subject and makes you feel that you're not, well, you're not in Kansas anymore. Sure. You're, oh, you're, you. Yeah, you're not, you're, you're, you're in Japan. You're in medieval Japan or late medieval Japan. And this game has been presented almost as if it could be a prop for a Kurosawa film. Mm. Now, if you was watching um, you know, Kagomusha or Ran, you would see maybe lurking in the background a stylized version of what GMT produced with this game, which is really nice in its own way. Mm -hmm. You also see this recently, I think, with some of the um, the newer Native American um, themed games that GMT have done, such as Navajo Wars and Comancheria, where you have, I, I haven't got either of them, but Me you either. do. Sorry? I, I don't have them either, but I know where you're headed. Uh, yeah, but you, yeah, they have that presentation which looks as if the game, as far as possible, has been um, manufactured by people working to a Native American aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of there's a very different look to markers on the map. The map has a look as if it has been like, painted or drawn on hide or, or something like that. Right. I think this is very important, and it's something that you wouldn't necessarily have got in years gone by although i do remember my very very first war game of any description which was a game called the battle of the little bighorn which uh, i got in 1968 for christmas with these little plastic soldiers and and native american braves and that map of the bighorn area was done as if it had been put on on hide and painted and put on a stretched frame um so yeah, yeah i mean these things they add something you know that adding a bit of art and quality art in the right place does help set a scene now to circle back and to touch back on the cow grease i love the when we were talking before we went live about some of the the non-culturally sensitive things that the british empire did would you care to touch on it yeah, sure, because, you know, this is where, again, we can also bring in this notion of the world moves on and doesn't move at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
the very, very famous event from um, ancient history, and I'm not wandering too far from the cow grease here. It's kind of it's lurking around. It, 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 we'll get, get it so you see, I keep saying cow grease. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, I was going to be referring first of all, sure, to massacre of free Roman legions in the Teutoburger Wald in 9 AD. Now, of course, you might legitimately ask, what on earth has that got to do with cow grease? Well, absolutely nothing and everything, because what we're talking about is when an imperial power completely misreads what it's dealing with. And in 9 AD, you had this chap called Varus, who thought, because he was told by people he thought he could trust, that the Germans were really getting used to the Roman way of life and they were all happily walking around and trading with the Romans and the first Roman towns were going up. And then he gets told by this very Roman German called Arminius, also known as Herman, <laughs> that um, yeah, he was, um, there was a bit of trouble over in the forests. And wouldn't it be a great idea if Varus went with his army and sorted it all out? And what Armenia sent it because he planned the whole thing. He led them further and further into the woods, into the forests in Germany, where the Romans' way of fighting was no damn good to them because they were too hemmed in. And because Varus trusted Armenius for too long and thought that the situation was far less threatening than it actually was, he walked right into one of the biggest traps in ancient history and managed to lose his own life and the life of three roman legions all of them wiped out with all their auxiliaries and that brings us back to the cavalry <laughs> yes it does it <laughs> yes it does because if i bring the subcontinent of asia into a broader context the british never really all together got on top of reading the various ethnicities and peoples. They did a better job later on, but there were hideous misinterpretations and one fed into another. And you can't be too surprised because the ruling British elite had trouble understanding ordinary working class British people, sure. let alone people from other parts of the world. We got pretty good at it in the end, but if you want an absolute parallel um, to what happened to Varus and his three legions, it happens, and the story is told in a war game, albeit a very small war game, called Kyber Rifles, mm. about how a chap by the name of Elphinstone, who was a doddery old fool who never should have been in charge of anything, <laughs> well, he'd been an aide to the Duke of Wellington during the Waterloo campaign. And he got himself wounded and he was actually tended by one of Napoleon's personal surgeons, which again has got nothing to do with cow grease, but we're kind of cir circling round now. Yes. He was given the job of going out to um going out to um Afghanistan and pacifying and dealing with people and seeing why there was a bit of trouble and sorting it all out. Sounds and familiar. yeah, he got it wrong. He trusted the wrong people. He didn't listen to his own advisors. He made the hideous mistake. Just as Varus had then tried to turn back through these hideous forests while massive great Germans are tracking javelins at them. So Elphinstone decided he had to retreat from Kabul. And of course, his army was going over terrible terrain at the wrong time of year. The Afghan warriors were in their element picked off one by one. He ends up very famous painting by a great uh, British female artist called Lady Butler uh, called The Retreat from Kabul. And all you see is one exhausted Brit soldier on his horse because that's all that is left. Mm. Um, so this misreading goes on time and time again. And I, I found evidence also of it, although it's not a subject I know very well, in Maori Wars, you know, the new Legion War Games title, right. where, you know, if a designer wants to bring this stuff in, 
they can do so in various ways. In Maori Wars, it's done mainly through the event tables. It's done because you're never quite sure which of the Maori are semi-pacified, which are inclining more towards the British stroke colonial power, and which of them would much rather live the way they always lived, thank you very much. It's a very fascinating war because the Maori actually fought from entrenchments hmm. and from stockades. I mean, they weren't um, the sort of people that were kind of dash out from the middle of nowhere, but they fought it from dugouts and trenches and they fought very, very well. And of course, where the legacy of it all comes to fruition is that after we've had this yet another unpleasant war against the native people, when we get to the Second World War, if you've ever played a game such as, well, it's one of those old classics that everyone's heard of, at least say you've heard of it, Anzio. <laughs> heard of it? Yeah, never played it. And own it, I believe. I'd have to go. Oh, right. Well, not only in Anzio, but also in one of the um, the Courtney Allen series of um, Storm Over Arnhem. Sure. Yeah, there's also Thunder at Casino. In Thunder at Casino and in Anzio, you will find Maori units. Mm. So these great people eventually end up fighting um, for what we can call the empire. Mm. Um, and of course, today, you know, one of the first absolute prerequisites for any British dignitary or, you know, if the if Prince Philip's driving in a straight direction. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about what happened there. All very unfortunate. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, the, when the royals go to New Zealand, they will be um, a, a greeting from the Maori. It's a little bit dodgy because they do seem like various other ethnicities in other parts of the world to have got the rough end of the stick. Okay. Um, there was a very famous film made, or a very good film made, not so many years ago. I think it's called We Were Warriors, which was about the plight of the Maori in modern-day New Zealand, hmm. uh, which is well worth a watch. Uh, but no, th there is, you see, th there's a dodgy side to this, or a difficult side to this, that, um, how can I put it? As soon as you start talking about fighting qualities, whether it's the Japanese or the Germans or the Native Americans, and all the different customs and traits, and as I said with the Native Americans, there's a lot of interesting profiling in the battles of the American Revolution when it comes to um, the native tribes that fought alongside the British, uh, also, of course, with um, the French-Canadian War. Um, probably more of an interesting profile so far because of the relationship with a European uh, people where they may have been in some kind of alliance mm -hmm. as opposed to being out and out conflict. Um, but with a lot of this, there is always a tendency to infer intentionally or otherwise that, you know, some people make better warriors than others. And of course, I can remember from many, many years ago, uh, there was an article that someone took exception to in the general, where someone had been writing about the Italian armed forces in the Second World War, and had cracked the usual jokes. And I think someone of American Italian heritage had said, look, you're getting a bit fed up with this. Mm. Um, you know, the major issue for the Italians in the Second World was probably that they were far too sensible to ever wanted to have been in it in the first place. Sure. And beyond that, they weren't, they didn't have the equipment. The only part of the Italian armed forces that was really up to snuff in 1940 was the Navy. And the Navy included some of the most incredible feats in terms of the, the valor of small units, such as the Italian frogmen. Uh, but, you know, if you were an Italian tanker in the Second World War, it took a vast amount of guts because the tanks you were driving were horrible. Sure. I mean, they wouldn't keep out a dried pea, you know. <laughs> a couple of questions have come in and we've got some more people in here. So let me, uh, uh, I'll get to Trevor's question in a second here. I wanted to mention, uh, we got a, a super chat in from Combat Board Games. Thank you very much, sir. 
Um, let's see, uh, James uh, Brazil is in saying uh, uh, he's listening in during lunch and just says, hi, guys. Hi. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, Trevor's, Trevor's doing a good job of coming in and mentioning uh, the uh, game titles just so that they're in the uh, in the chat area. We've got Andrew McDonald. Uh, he says he could listen to Paul talk history all day long. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm yeah. that. Yes, and Trevor loves, he's got you quoted here, it's a wee bit dodgy. He loves that. Yeah. <laughs> And then we'll get to his question, which he actually asked a little bit ago. Um, let's see. Question from Trevor. You mentioned the extra little touch can really impress. What map really made you step back and say, wow? Uh, it would depend upon what part of my own gaming life I would be looking at. Um there's always that tension between whether a map really looks brilliant and still works in a practical sense sure, or whether sure. the practicality goes out the window. I think probably the first map I ever saw and one of my friends at school infused about it said, oh, you've got to get this game. It is so damn good. Was Anzio for, mm. for the map, which was one of the most beautiful hand-drawn maps of its era. Um, amongst modern maps, uh, I would have to join present opinion. I think a lot of people have enjoyed the map to Maori Wars, okay. which has basically taken what I think is almost like an old style Atlas view of the Northern Island of New Zealand and is giving it an understated period look. Okay. I like maps that do have that sense of belonging to the time in which they are set. So I do like the Clash of Arms maps. I'm not so keen on, you know, when they go the whole hog with all these beautiful representations of uniforms on the fronts of the units, so all the important information's on the back. But that kind of map, a lot of the things that Rick Barber has done, um, a game that I've yet to get around to playing uh, is Long Street Attacks, the, um, the game that my friend Herman Lutman did, did on the um, second day of Gettysburg. And that's another great Rick Barber map. I mean, he, he just knows how to make these things look wonderful. Hmm. Uh, but Turning Point Stalingrad, a game from some years ago, nice balance. Uh, my friend Emmanuel seemed to spend an incredible amount of time doing the map for um, Stalingrad Inferno on the Volga. Boy, he did. Yeah, he used yeah. the... Uh... He used the German uh, air, air surveillance, yeah, to recreate. Uh, and you know, that map was painted in little by little by little. Just tiny little slivers of it until it, it built up. It was an absolute labor of love. Um, but, you know, the, the, it is part of, I, I can put up with very basic maps uh if they get the job done but it's always wonderful if a map carries mood maybe the season of the year in which it's set mm -hmm. uh has a period feel to it um but you know there's probably been too many for me to list that many off the top of my head yeah um you know i i run uh i definitely I mean, I, I recognize a beautiful map when I see it. I always look for form or function over the form of it a little bit more. And then probably the thing that runs me counter to some of what we're even talking about here is that I, I love tactical war games. So a lot of times what I'm getting into is how much does it immerse me into the tactical combat? Academy games and their photorealistic maps I like, but I know – in our context here, we're really talking more of those strategic maps and that, like you'd mentioned, um, which one was it that had the, it looked like it, the, the hide was stretched and that was part of the map? Oh, that was, well, in Britain, it was published by a company called Waddington's. Okay. Uh, Waddington's would also have done the British version of Monopoly and, and, and games like that. Uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, I think it first came out around about 1964 um and you had this little group of like u.s cavalrymen they're just little plastic soldiers and a larger group of mounted and dismounted like indian warriors 
and the map itself much to my surprise when i actually got a chance to look properly at the little bighorn area instead of me thinking or assuming that this map bore no relevance to it at all because it you know i was playing this at eight years old it actually has a fair resemblance mm. to the little bighorn area but it was that aesthetic it it looked quite impressive you, you'll find photographs of it on bgg of of these um you know different soldier types and warrior types and um i mean the only thing that was a bit wrong with it is that you had a few upturned wagons and, and crates and things in the middle of the board but um no i mean it was so different from looking at a monopoly board or anything like that um have a board that meant something to me well 1914 the avalon hill game because i looked at that and thought what on earth have i got into here <laughs> um then of course a map that some people loved and other people thought was a bit too much was the map ball to gettysburg 77 okay. the the, um, the avalon hill game which was a mass of color and contours and you had to have a terrain key right at the back of the map uh, of the rule book to let you know what you were really looking at mm -hmm. uh, but you know the the seki gahara i just thought set a completely new standard for it had that courage it isn't just going to be blocks or little plastic figures we're going to have blocks that look like the master of the clan the master the warlord i think it's dojo or whatever mm -hmm. i can't remember domo um ordered this to be made so that he could study the war that he planned to fight Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did do an excellent job on that. Uh, yeah, my buddy Marshall, game. yeah, my buddy Marshall had had that on the P500 forever, and he was like, man, I hope when's it going to make it to it? And he got it. Yeah. And, uh, he was thrilled. And, uh, you know, of course, now what, what's it gone through? A couple printings? Uh, three, maybe even? I think it's, it might even be heading towards a fourth, because as soon as it goes out of print, out of availability, I think it's a pretty pretty common cert that it gets, it gets printed again. Yeah, and and that it's one of those P five hundred magic games that it, it struggled there for a while, and uh, then when it showed up, it was like it had all the pieces were magically put together perfectly. Mm. Let's see, we've got uh, James says uh, maps and war games are exceptional, and I I think that is a, a nice era that we're in. That I believe that is a big piece of the attention to detail currently is is what they can do with their boards and how they can really work on the maps. I know, uh, you know, Judd has uh, map artists that he just, he'll buy games just based on the map artwork. Uh, I mean, I know he researches into the type and stuff, but he gets real excited just based on on uh, who the designer of the map was. Yeah. I mean, heading off at a slight angle, one of the games that I got over the Christmas period which hasn't got any map of, well, it's got a playing surface if you want to buy it, but you don't need it, is a card game called 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. Hmm. Now, this is the story of 1066. It's not line a lot of units up on a hill and have a lot of Norman Knights charge at them. It is the story, and it has done its level best through brilliant artwork to create the mood and ambience of the story of the end of Saxon England. And um, that is a very stunning game, which again, places a high uh, priority on a quality aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what I, I really wanted to kind of move to, we we're talking about, you know, you can have this issue about, you know, are we ever presenting certain people with it being better at war or fighting or a triumphing war than another people and you can get yourself into all kinds of issues with this so i thought if i was going to talk about this in any way the only nation i could possibly name and keep to was my own hmm. um because you know there, there is such a thing as following the course of british history as i mentioned at the very beginning of this talk social to military to practice of arms by looking at what has happened to Britain um, from about the time of the end of the Napoleonic Wars onwards. Because stories such as that, even in a little game like Khyber Rifles, 
or presented in more in a larger context such as the game the great game the game legion war game you know you have this story of an increasingly dubious upper ruling class in britain that isn't up to the job of ruling in a more modern context and yet it's still there and it leads to these hideous misinterpretations and misjudgments such as the failure um to um to read what was going on in afghanistan then you can come to we well, take a, a game um someone i know uh, as, as a correspondent jack green you know he's got this new jutland game or world war one naval combat game coming out well we all know the joke well not the joke that the, the kind of reality was so many of the british ships that were built in the first world war that they were eggshells armed with hammers mm. you know great guns but don't expect them to withstand being hit back and of course at jutland we had three battle cruisers blow up and again you can simply say, take that in the context of oh well that's just the nature of what happened at jutland on what might happen if you refight jutland of course the bigger context is it's a representation of what was going wrong with british science and industry mm. that we weren't building well enough that we built a lot of ships but we never widened the docks so that they didn't have a wide enough fire platform which meant that when british ships fired they rocked mm. and, and you get all of this is why we never managed to produce a decent tank through the course of the second world war and then as soon as the war is over or very nearly as soon as the war is over we've gone into one of the greatest tanks of all time god knows where that came from but the centurion of course <laughs> we could have done with that a couple of years earlier you know you don't like the cromwell <laughs> no, <laughs> no. bloody ugly thing <laughs> uh, it was a little blockish it was it, look, it looks like a mobile lego tank <laughs> <laughs> It looks like someone's taking a lot of green Lego bricks and bolting them around. <laughs> no, I, I've uh, oh, what was it? There's a brand new series where the uh, oh, the, the the guy goes around and it's called like Inside the Tank or something, and he climbs yeah. around. Yeah, he spends a lot of time with the uh, different tanks, especially over there. You guys have some great museums over there armored museums yeah i was as a child i went to the tank museum i haven't been there for years but it, there's the, the tank museum is at a place called bovington which is in yes, Dorset. yes. and that is, a, that is a very fine museum and of course you can always um find the um the musings of one or two of the museum um curators on youtube uh including, i think it's a mr shepherd who is an absolute genuine 100 percent english eccentric and I think by anyone interested in military history is regarded as a bit of a national treasure. Yes. Real quick, Combat Board Game says uh, he saw both of us on, uh, particularly you, and he had to drop in. He says, Paul needs to write another wargaming book, and he wants uh, me to get back to editing that last ham tag episode that I yeah. had. No, no, no. There is, there is another book on its way. Um, it will be ready by about spring this year. Ah, well, what's the title? Are you ready to announce anything? Or? Well, yeah, the title is, I mean, how original can you get? Of course, the first book was called A Dicey Business. Mm -hmm. The second book is called Even Dicier Business. <laughs> That's good. Play on the success of the first. Well, it is, it is a little bit, it's a little bit longer, and in a very mild way, it's a little bit ruder. Huh. Uh, not in a nasty way, you know, not in the sense that... Um, People think I'm being coarse or anything, but he's uh, sorry. I keep disappearing here, but uh, no, it's um, there's plenty of war game content in that one. Gotcha. Now Trevor says uh, so. He's yes, a new book from Paul. Uh, we have uh, a question from Trevor uh, for Paul. What war slash battle do you enjoy playing the most, and which do you enjoy the least? Um, I think the war. Um, I've got a running joke with which one I enjoy the least. And I'm going to come out and I'm going to tell him to his, well, not to his face, but he might tune in later. <laughs> uh, battle that I, I enjoy the most is Waterloo. Um, and the campaign stroke military event I enjoy the least. It's a Franco-Prussian war. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a running joke again with Herman Lutman, who's designed what many people regard as being one of the finest Franco-Prussian war 
um, simulations. Uh, I think it's at any cost. He may have done more than one by now, um, but he's a very, very fine designer. It's just that I would kind of constantly rib him about, and I was interested in Stonewall as a, in um, uh, Long Street Attacks, his game on the second day at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just couldn't bring myself to name the other one, so it was just called the other one. <laughs> How are you getting on with the other one? <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. I mean, I, my, my tastes have changed as I've got older. And, you know, I, I'm really enjoying the idea of playing Maori Wars. I'm really enjoying the notion of getting around to playing these, these games of the Indian Wars and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, a, a recent interest has been the Boer War. But as something about the Franco-Prussian War, I, I don't know. I, I just can't find a context that interests me. But Let's face it, there's plenty of other things out there and plenty of people that do like the Franco-Prussian War. Sure. I just uh, I, I put a note up here. So uh, check out the quote inside the Chieftain's Hatch for those great YouTube uh, tank videos. Uh, it showed up right on my side here where he's got one inside the Chieftain's Hatch. And yeah. he's looking at the T-34-85. Uh, That's, uh, I think, listed as his first episode. Well, the, the chief, the, the chieftain had a bit of an Achilles heel. It was mm. a great tank in many ways, but of course, it was meant to be able to run, in theory, by stopping off at a German petrol station and filling itself up. <laughs> what they didn't mention was that in order to change over from its standard fuel to filling up at um, at kind of Gunther's Gunther's filling station somewhere somewhere outside of Essen, you had to completely strip off the tank out. Ah. And it was an engineer's job that would take the best part of a day, I think. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't quite as ideal as people thought it was. Oh man, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a great one from James. Uh, a little tongue in cheek here, Paul. Do you read your own audio books? Do I read my? I would hope one day to do my own audio <laughs> book. Um, yeah, I know he's he's got a big smile where he wants you to do it at the uh, end here. So that's Actually, really joking aside, I mean, I know I speak with a fairly broad London accent. Oh, but they I, love it. They love it. Yeah, I can speak very poorly when I want to. <laughs> I think but it's I, I can. You know, I, 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 mean, I can switch it on like that, you know. And uh, I maybe mean, you wouldn't recognize you, would you? You know, I mean, it, 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 you know it, it, that's enough of that because otherwise I'll probably break my sound system here. So, you know, <laughs> I we'll love go back to the normal voice. No, that's perfect. I think they'd be a big fan of that. Actually, I, I will tell you, I think a lot of folks love when the author reads their own audiobooks. So mm -hmm. they do the reading for it. Well, this looks pretty good. Let's hit a uh, uh, bring it. Uh, you got a couple more things to uh, cover, and then uh, in a little bit, we'll wrap it up here. Well, um, one thing that I, I, if I kind of offer a little bit of self promotion here, is that. Uh, of course. Uh, I've got the lead article in the forthcoming uh, War Diary, which is issue 3.4, where I am looking at the Schlieffelen plan and why it didn't work. And as I did with one of my earlier articles for the magazine, where I looked at Admiral Trowbridge's failure to engage the German battlecruiser Gerben at the beginning of the First World War, and looked at what might have happened if he had have done by using a game called the Royal Navy. Uh, I use a variety of different beginning of the First World War simulations, uh, such as Grand Illusion. I use a lot of the Schlieffen plan from the Devil Creek system and uh, one or two other designs and look at, well, I hammer through the Schlieffen plan and look at what it was capable of doing and why it failed. And um, so if anyone does like my prose as much as that, that they're very welcome. Um, another thing I am doing right now, of course, is that Emmanuel has another game coming out. Really? Uh, yeah. Well, he keeps putting these photographs on. I mean, they're kind of tiny little portions of the map and tiny little portions of particular counters. So I better not tell you what it's about. Though if anyone can't work it out at the moment, I'll be very surprised. Okay. Um, but let's just say that I'm doing the historical notes for it. And I did the notes 
for I did a lot of the background notes for the Stalingrad game. Yes. Um, I've turned it again for this new game in that the notes for this one, um, the notes of the Stalingrad game were quite serious. I lightened up a bit for the briefs, um, the, 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 the bits which were to do with the dossier, mm -hmm. you know, powerless as a commander and um, sniping in Stalingrad. Uh, but the notes for this one are proving to be a hell of a lot of fun. Mm. Uh, where I've, I've, I'm afraid I've, I've given vent to one of my little predilections, which is I love playing on words. Excellent. Uh, so that's that's coming up. Um, we're all working like Billio and Emmanuel is very, very good at getting games out on time. I like to think I'm pretty good at getting articles finished on time. So, um, and then I've got a review coming up of. Um, a game, well, several games that I, I've done and worked through recently or about to work through. Um, there's a new game um, on Verdun okay. by a gentleman by the name of Ray, uh, Ray Weiss, who's got his own little company, CSL. Hmm. And uh, I thought that was well worth doing a review of. So that's due to be posted on the Bald Gaming Life, hopefully in the next few days. Uh, because I've done all the artwork and I've done everything for it, and that's ready to roll. Um, I will be doing a review of 1066 Tears to Many Mothers Excellent. for the ball for the ball gaming way, ball, 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 yeah, the ball gaming way. And then um, I'm back with a really exciting project for a future war diary, um, mm. which is um, I'll be looking at four games on the same subject. And I've got a really good title for that, but that's all undercover. <laughs> okay, beautiful, beautiful. James says uh, word choice and puns are great. Andrew McDonald says there is a theory there was no Schleifen plan. I'll say that wrong if I apologize with my German. <laughs> yeah, the the the, the, um, the Schleifen plan. <clears throat> Schleifen. I mean, it was, we were still talking about cow grease, don't you? <laughs> 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 we, we were all right on that. Yeah, that's right, and I've got German heritage, but it didn't stick with the language. No, anyway, the um, the, the Schlieffen plan. The, the one of the things that I do stress in the article is that certainly the plan was tinkered around with an awful lot between Schlieffen dying and the beginning of war, and I do bring that into account. So rest assured that we are, you won't be reading about the article from the point of view of there was this Schlieffen plan and it was exactly the same in 1914 as it was in 1906 mm. um, or whenever it was actually finished. What I do stress, however, is that the problem you've got is that there was a reason why those German forces were balanced towards a march through Belgium and possibly in the first concept through Southern Netherlands as well. And the thing is, if you take Schlieffen and his plan out of the equation, the question then becomes, well, what plan did the Germans have in 1914? And some people do offer alternatives on this, but I've never been entirely convinced. Um, I, I think that one line that I do use um, in one thing that I've written recently is that... Um, the Germans have proved remarkably good at not being able to finish wars that they start. Mm -hmm. And Schlieffen and the plan, or what was supposed to take place with the plan, are, are, are part of that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't mind saying that. I mean, I've got some German heritage if you go back far enough. Well, I think history would bear out what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, let's see. I know you've also had... Uh, You've uh, you've been hard at it with your paintbrush as well. Is that correct? Yes, I've been I've been working on a commission. That's uh, so I think you had mentioned that in one of your emails. Uh, yeah, and I've I've been doing a lake scene um, for a um, a friend who wants to give a birthday present uh, to a chap who's just moved into his new home, mm. and there's a lovely great big wall. And um, the idea is that I would have painted this very large canvas, which I've now virtually finished, wow. and present it to him as a birthday present, which is wonderful because that is why I paint. There you go. It's, it's a wonderful way of um, 
bring a little bit more happiness into the world. I love that. Perfect. Yeah. And, I, and the really positive thing is I, just for once, I managed not to get paint all over the carpet and all over myself. <laughs> How I managed to do that, I don't know. <laughs> well, Paul, like always, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been a pleasure. Um, uh, thank you for for coming on. We'd been planning on doing this this uh, tomorrow, Saturday, and then I happened to have a uh, a little extra time on a Friday, and and we've knocked it out. I know uh, I know it's late where you're at. Well, all I've got to do, I'm not, I've planned ahead for this. You see, so tonight's incredibly complex meal that I was going to do for myself and my incredibly complex wife. <laughs> as um that's, that's that's all being parked oh okay we're not, we're not doing that tonight it's, it's pizza tonight ah all i've got to do is throw the oven over open and shove it in and 10 minutes later it'll be done and uh, the complex meal will go back to sunday now uh, james brazil uh brazil says oil on canvas with a question mark acrylic acrylic excellent yeah. and then uh combat board games uh, ask Mr. Combin is always a class guest and is always passionate about history and war games. He is a great ambassador for our hobby. Thanks for this. It made my day. You're more than welcome. I look forward at some point in the not too distant future. We'll, we'll go again. You bet. So thank you to everybody. Um, Paul, hang on here. I'm going to stop the broadcast, but you and I, uh, hang on just a little bit. We're still live, but it should cycle off shortly. We'll see. <laughs> Let me try that again. See.